Welcome to Perceptions Today. It happens to be UK date, the 7th of March. And also it happens to be 2023. It happens to be Twitter space chat 50. And we are getting the opportunity to talk to Rick Herrick, PhD, the evolving state to commune with a higher wisdom. If you've not been here before, Perceptions Today is all about contemplating consciousness topics in all different areas. I'm your host, Paul, and your co-host is Melissa. Hello, everybody. I'm sure you've already met me by now. <laughs> oh, you're doing that on purpose, that large gap to say the room's collapsed. And also, <laughs> our aim is actually to reach out to people who've got questions about perception, and I would definitely say that about the way that technology's been with us today, whether they've got experiences or they're researchers and philosophers on these topics. We also have other events which are being planned, so if you want to keep kept up to date, I would say go to perceptionstoday.com, get onto the mailing list, and you will be just emailed about the events and the podcasts that are released. Also, you'll find out about all our different other social media platforms, whether it be Instagram, Mastodon, Tribal, Facebook, etc. So what I would like to do is do a very quick bio of Rick and give you an idea of who he is, and then he will give you a bigger idea and we will take it further from that point in. And from last time, he will be quite happy if hands are put up for asking questions at any point after the quick summary of his bio, and we'll be able to do that. So without further delay, sorry for laughing too much. It's because we've had all these technical difficulties. My brain is kind of on uh, laughing too much. Rick Herrick has been a former tenured university professor and also the author of six books, novels, as well as three works of nonfiction. Also produced a musical, which was a play at the Lighthouse Point and was performed as a fundraiser for the Martha's Vineyard Museum in 2013. Also a magazine editor. And what I would say is it's just really great he's been able to participate with us to come forward and have this experience, which hasn't gone smoothly, but we're trying to get that sorted out. So if you would like to do more of a bio of yourself and why we decided to talk about how to commune from the viewpoint of where you were coming from in your early stages of looking at consciousness and why you've evolved into the meditation techniques, that'd be great, if that sounds good to you. Okay, well, thank you for that uh, kind introduction for all your patience with getting this technology to work you've been very tall on me i just have been sitting here terrified that i was causing the problems but i guess they're all resolved so it's really uh an honor for me to be on the podcast uh so um if one i can start with talking about uh, my approach to meditation is that kind of where you'd like me to start I think it would be great to actually start really at the beginning of why you started to get into it, what you found was not working for you and how you oh, got okay. into where you are. So that okay. would give people an idea, along with whether you got told by okay. certain individuals or books and that kind of reference point to come into it. Uh, okay. Well, for as long as I can remember, and I have no idea thought or focus where my life has come from, but... I have wanted to live the things of Jesus. And so uh, I started praying and asked uh, God to kind of cleanse my heart so that I could live uh, better for my neighbor. And uh, it didn't work very well. I found the Bible inspiring, but not very helpful in changing my behavior. And so about 40 years ago, I had this wonderful friend who uh, uh, taught with university, was an expert on uh, Eastern philosophy, and he got me uh, uh, reading it. He kind of a mentor. I mean, I'm sure as uh, you know, and most of the people in your audience, literature on Eastern philosophy is just huge. So he kind of steered me through it, and uh, I was really attracted to simple things of the Buddha, and I began uh, uh, doing a very simple, mindful meditation uh, with the uh, hope, uh, as the Buddha says, if you clean the perception, uh, uh, if you clean your windows of your perception, how you perceive, you will see the world differently. And so uh, over time, uh, over you know, a fairly long practice of mindful 
meditation, I really actually made uh, quite a bit of progress along those lines. Um, so uh, that's, uh, I guess, somewhat of the early stages of my journey. And I've just stayed with it. Um, and it, it, I can talk, I guess, about the simple practice. I'm sure that uh, all of the hosts in the audience are quite familiar with mindful meditation. Uh, I just um, quiet my mind and uh, through focusing on my breathing. And once I'm at, I kind of pretend that I'm uh, up in a tree looking down uh, on my life. And uh, what I'm trying to do is understand uh, a lot of my psychological junk, what Jung calls her shadow, all my grievances, anger, uh, those kinds of things. And what I've learned is if you can know what's driving uh, why you're having trouble, and if you can understand what's driving it, kind of uh, let it go. Uh, uh, these emotions that are rather negative and, and self-destructive kind of lose their power. And so the big lesson uh, that I've learned from meditation is if you have a, a psychological perception that's full of grievances and insecurities and uh, uh, those kinds of negative things, what happens is that you're very self-absorbed and uh, your focus is very narrow and you can't focus uh, beyond yourself very well. But once you start to clean that out and understand uh, some of these problems as the Buddha teaches, you kind of uh, can come to see the world differently. So that's what I have uh, uh, really gained from 40 years of this rather simple meditative practice. Uh, there's two things uh, that I have uh, uh, found that are really kind of special. Through this mindful meditation, I have kind of encountered what we might call divine wisdom. And uh, when I uh, have had uh, uh, a complicated personal issue to deal with, I've taken it to meditation and uh, I've found kind of drifting through my awareness the most creative solutions to the problem uh it's kind of getting goosebumps and i say wow where, where did this come from? and certainly not myself uh and so uh, uh that's been special in my life the uh, other as i've gotten older and uh uh psychologists are really uh no longer uh so burdens uh i've kind of uh meditated more on gratitude and uh i kind of thank god for uh all the blessings in my life which have been many and when i look at it think about it uh it's almost like i have a guy i've got uh, uh some entity or force that is kind of looking out for my best interest steering me in good direction so uh i'm eternally grateful for that uh and so that's kind of been my experience with this rather simple buddhist form of meditation that uh you know i've practiced for 40 years that's fantastic because i've got a few questions myself obviously oh, good. if people have got follow-up questions i've been trying to sort myron out as well and at the moment he's just asking me a quick question which i'm going to try and figure out with that but when you obviously started and you were handed books on this by your friend can you remember the titles oh wow well it doesn't have to be if you can't remember then that's not a problem it's just I can. interesting to see I can. Um, it was like, like I said, many years ago. And I once, once I got on practice, uh, I haven't really uh, spent much time going back through the literature because I'm very happy with what I do. But over the years, I've uh, enjoyed reading Jack Cornfield, uh, Johanna Macy. The Christian uh, mindfulness guy, Richard Rohr, is another one. I've been inspired by several of the mystics, the Cloud of Unknowing, uh, uh, some of the other uh, 13th and 14th century mystics. Um, 
Currently, uh, I'm a big fan of the Dalai Lama. Uh, I've read books by Karen Armstrong uh, more recently that deals with Buddhism. Uh, just to kind of refresh my memory, it was a short book. So that's kind of something, but I can't remember all the stuff that he had me do because I say it was at least 40 years ago, and I spent maybe two or three years uh going through all this with him, he was kind of like a teacher. You know, we would read a book and then discuss it. And once I got uh, uh, happy, uh, mindful meditation, uh, and I discovered that it was actually working for me, I really didn't uh, uh, do much reading after that. Uh, but what so I have done... Intuitive. What, what I have done well is I've kept at it. Uh, I do it pretty much every day, I would say, maybe for half an hour. Uh, and uh, it's something I look forward to doing. I don't do it at a particular time, but I usually do it in a very comfortable chair that I like and uh, where it's quiet. And, uh, so, yeah, that's kind of my meditation story. <laughs> that, which is great because you evolved into it with obviously having been led via a friend into that did you then feel the need to as you said you didn't need to go once you've done through books but did you end up at the very early stages talking to others about it or was it mainly just between the two of you okay uh it was mostly between the the two of us and as i say i mean we we are still friends uh and discuss it to some extent that's kind of interesting. Uh, you know, people have asked me uh, if you need a teacher uh, to meditate. And, you know, I think that that is up to ev every person to make their own decision. I really, I mean, I had my friend, uh, but I basically experimented on my own. And in some ways, it's one of the easiest things to do in the world, really. Uh, uh, so uh, I don't know where I really stand on that issue. The only thing that I really feel pretty strongly about, if your teacher says that this is the only way or the best way to do it, then I would look for another. Uh, uh, but uh, I don't really have a position on that. I've just kind of done it on my own. What I do works, and so I've just kind of kept at it. That's great. I mean, when, obviously, we're now going into the fact of you go through the mindfulness practice. And again, when we were starting a week ago, you also said it was very easy for you to even do it with inside being traveling as a passenger in a car. You didn't yeah. need to have too much isolation because right. right. you've already trained yourself to be that way to let go of things, which is great. And following into that, the bits which... I'm really interested in, and again, I think the rest of the people will be, is because of the way that you're talking, that you get that connection point. Do you get the answer in imagery, sound, or visuals, uh, or auditory? That's a beautiful uh, question. I get it in thoughts flow through my awareness. Um, and so I'm not sure I, I actually... Uh, talked about my process what i do is when I, when my mind is quiet i put myself up in a tree pretending and looking down at my life and uh i ask questions and and that explore some of my issues but when i've had some big uh kind of conflicts that i've had to deal with um i've just kind of gotten into a state laid it out and kind of sat back and refocused again on my breathing and these uh answers uh just kind of flow through my awareness um uh is this and, almost and, like an instantaneous thing or does it take days before the answer no, comes no, to no. you it, it it doesn't it's not either uh i mean uh sometimes they've come quickly but sometimes i've just stayed at, at you know five or ten or fifteen minutes later some things kind of start bubbling through my awareness, which are beautiful and good and surprising. The thing is, they're surprising. I, I had never thought of approaching the issue in that way, and uh, which has kind of led me to think that they're really not coming from me. They're coming from some other source, which um, uh, is pretty exciting. Uh, Definitely, because the way that you're portraying it to me, and again, I'm sure others will put their hands up and ask other questions, it's almost like a telephone call. 
And instead of sometimes getting it immediately, it's almost as if someone sat back, contemplated the question that you're phrasing, and then given you information while you're still within the meditative kind of state. Yes? Right. Um, and, you know, I can't remember. I haven't had a, uh, something was really perplexing in a while. And I can't remember if I had to go back uh, to a second or a third session, but I don't ever remember having to do that. Uh, it seems to me that, you know, uh, over the course of uh, 15 or 20 minutes, these thoughts were just come kind of bubbling into my awareness. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it was just very exciting uh, and very helpful. You know, uh, these were win-win answers. And uh, so they were very helpful. Hey, this is a test. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I got, I don't know how I did this, but I did it. I went, I went on Perceptions Today, your main site, and somehow, and I went down to, to, to uh, Twitter and click there and it gave me the icon so i don't know how that happened but it worked so i'll shut up now well it's good to have you on board yeah i i, I was i just started listening and i thought i'll try one more thing before i give up and it worked so the gods are finally on my side oh good <laughs> <laughs> so all right go ahead and keep talking and then i'll i'll respond later okay well uh I, would you like me to kind of uh Paul, speak very briefly about how this relates to my book, Paul. Uh-oh. Um, I'm not quite sure what's happened to Paul, but I think that's a great idea. Go for it. Oh, okay. Are you, and you're Melissa, right? Yes. Okay. It's okay, everybody. I'm, I'm it's just I was on mute it. while I was talking to people. <laughs> well, so, Paul, I, before you... I was... Uh -oh. I was just going to okay. comment, please. No, 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 Rick, <laughs> stay where you are on this position, because I got a few questions which I'm going to lay into okay. uh, Myron, which will be good because it will help with the content. And again, as people have seen, I've put up in the question box because obviously the room crashed that we're going to try and keep to like three minute response rate on this because of how we can do things. Also, nice to see you third eye as well, Dan. So it's nice to see you as well. Let's see. We haven't just lost anyone, have we? Just as I was trying to get things right. Right. Okay. Yeah. The dodginess of the world. Right. So here we go. Because Rick was talking about when he was getting information in his meditative state, presumably you feel that you're getting it from a non-emotional kind of state, that you're, whatever you're attached to gives you the answer, or do you feel it's got kind of an emotion with it as it comes to you? Uh... It's yeah. It's mostly objective. It, it's there isn't much emotion that's so it's neutral, it. right? Okay. Yes. Right. So that's good because that also will lay into where I'm going to bring in with Myron because you said that you're feeling like you're getting it from another source as well that provides information. Myron's got the ability to tell you about how content is coming from his source, Karen, when contemplating things as well as you don't always have to be in a meditative state to be given information do you Myron? no karen can is here now standing right in front of me and i can so, talk to i can talk to it her she them whatever uh anytime i want to because i'm not sure if you heard before but when rick goes into his mindful state and again he can be anywhere traveling etc i'll be interesting to know if you can do it while you're walking i shall ask you that question he gets to a state where when contemplating information or puzzles for his life it will come to him in a neutral state within either a very short space of time but while he's still in the state so it sounds very similar to how other people are connecting with their guides and again you've got shadow fox who again you say you have your guides as well so you've got knowledge of how that works you could also pass that to rick how you feel and how either the similarity or non-similarity well, yeah you know, yeah i'd love to because um even in meditation in any form, um, what we what you're describing is what we happen to call like either zero point or the eye of the observer. And that's, you know, ideas or you say things, they just kind of float mm. by. Sorry to just so butt in on you, Shadow Fox, but Rick probably doesn't know your background. So it'd be quite good for you to quickly give a 30 second overview of yourself. 
Oh my, yeah, I could. Um, yeah, I'm just a person, with an experiencer since I was uh, three years old. I had a near death experience both at three and at six, and I've never seen the world the same way. I see everything in energy, wow. everything, everything. So That's patterning, nice. so on and so forth. And I have always always had my guides angels ascended masters i have a couple um guides that are with me all the time and others come in they'll teach they'll do what they have to do and then they move on however in meditation there are so many many different techniques that uh, i had explored like for probably 30 years um, for mindful meditation. I mean, I've done all kinds, just breathing, just listening to sound. Um, and honestly, I think like you had said, it's really one of the more easier things to do. I think a lot of times people, you know, put up the barriers and think that they can't get there. Um, the hardest thing for most people seems to be is to quiet the mind. Um, and then to stay with the meditation. Yes, yes, exactly. But yeah, no, it's great to meet you. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I work. I predominantly work a lot with um, uh, healing light energy. I call it the angel therapy. Um, it's just working like through imagination with with the energy of light. And that's, yeah. So we, my husband and I have a book up on the table. We're getting ready to publish. So nice. yeah, yeah. Right. I'm going to bring Melissa in and then get to Myron, but that's a good explanation of where you come from. And it doesn't matter what culture you come from. You can learn it from anybody from what we've been experiencing over our conversations. Melissa. Yeah. Um, thanks Paul. I just wanted to say, cause before you were saying, Oh, Shadow Fox, you have guides as well. We all have. It's just how much Sorry, time... I'll just qualify that. You recognize <laughs> them. And they're there. And they're talking in a manner. I mean, I, as I told you all, yeah. I've realized that that gut feeling of where it makes me feel sick, I have to do it. And I've been nudged in different ways. But you've got more yeah. predominant guides, which are better to you than the ones that keep on kicking me yeah so yeah. you can explain it, melissa it boils down to time spend with them and also your sensitivity to energy because spirits energy right so if you're and ways that you can become more sensitive to energy is through meditation and because my background is i don't know, i've always been very spiritual i've always had very spiritual experiences from young and when in my 20 year stage where I was getting a lot of anxiety attacks and depression and the only thing that got me out of that was and I went to a doctor she tried to prescribe me with medication which were antidepressants and I said no because I've seen the side effects of that I've seen people go through withdrawal symptoms and I said I'm going to find other ways so meditation was the only way I could heal myself from these anxiety attacks and that's and I started to love just sitting for an hour and the more I did that the more sensitive I became to energy and the more sensitive I became to my guides as well and um, so I just want to make that clear for everyone that you can also get in touch with your guides you just need to spend that time with them and and meditate and train yourself to meditate it can be a bit of a struggle if you're just starting out because especially if you've got a busy mind but it's it's <coughs> focusing on the breath is um is a is a major one on helping you to go deeper within i i really like that idea of a guide because i i really think that's kind of what i've had and i i never started uh doing all this to find a guide it's kind of happened it was just a nice side effect of my in inner work, I guess you'd say. Oh, definitely. I'm going to bring Myron and then Alexia in, but with the way that guides also work, and again, I've reflected <coughs> over my period of my life and how things have happened, you can imagine it like the maze on a tilting board where you've got little alleyways where your ball bearing or marble can go down and you've got holes, but you've got somebody who's tilting that board and you're the marble and they're putting you into different locations. And sometimes you get stuck down the wrong end of a maze. And then sometimes they put you in an amazing place. And it's really kind of a strange thing to 
realize when you look at it from the objective where other people have got fully fledged kind of slap you in the face get on with it kind of comments or other ways of it presenting itself myron yeah i don't know if paul uh explained to you that <clears throat> when i was four years old i was in a coma for months and uh of course it's 1948 so they had no idea what what caused the coma or anything else and uh, they basically told my parents, <clears throat> if he comes out of it, he comes out of it. If he doesn't, he doesn't. Well, I came out of it after about, some people say four months, some say longer. I never, the records are, are lost. But uh, anyway, when I came out of it, Charon, my spirit guide, was standing in the room. And it was the only person, only being that I actually recognized. I forgot my family. I didn't know who they were. I didn't know who my brother was. I didn't know where I lived. I didn't know what my name was. I didn't know anything. I just knew that that being standing in the corner over there was my, I didn't know that word spirit guy, but my friend, let's put Your it that Your friend, way. yeah. <clears throat> and so Karen has been my friend my whole life and has gotten me through n just numerous terrible things and taken me to wonderful and magical places. Um, I don't, re I don't meditate. I do meditate every day for two hours, but I don't meditate to call Charon because I don't have to call Charon. Charon is always standing near me. So there's no calling. It's, it's, she's just here. I call her she now. I used to call her he, now I call her she. So it's an it really. But anyway, um, the other part thing I wanted to say was that, um, years ago, I, I went to see uh, a lecture by Baba Muktananda here in the United States, um, a great teacher uh, in India. And um, uh, I kind of blew it off when I went to the, when I went to the uh, event. But later when I was on the mountain where I go to to, to uh, meditate sometimes and seek my energy, Baba came to me. So my point was that that Baba came to me out of a blue light and taught me for oh, many, many months, taught me a lot of <clears throat> very special <coughs> lessons that he had. So I didn't request Bobby to come. He just came. So sometimes nice. sometimes these beings come to me. Uh, I also have 12 allies. Uh, now, this is a very complicated thing, so I don't want to go through all the details. But I have, besides Caron, there are 12 uh, allies. And I can send those allies to anyone I want to send them to. And I have done that in the past with some, I'm a vet, so I send, <clears throat> I send allies to help veterans. It helps them. I don't know how or why, it just does. And um, I work at the VA a lot, and, um, uh, and, I, and I bring my allies with me and, and send them, you know, from room to room to room to room. And uh, I've always done that. And then, of course, um, they're with me all the time. I don't always see them, but I always see Karen. She's always visible. <clears throat> I don't have to make her visible. She is visible. And um, um, there are a lot of explanations, and it's, it's a long, long story, and everybody here has probably already heard it, so I'm not going to tell you the story. But the fact is that, that um, uh, be beca because I have a, a damaged left hippocampus, it affects my visual memory. Um, so I have epilepsy. And I also have sense, but I have epilepsy. And um, uh, some neurologists believe that it's the that it's, that it's this tumor that is giving me the, the the connection to the to the spirit guide. I think they're wrong. Um, um, I was on the board of directors of the Epilepsy Foundation here in the and the national level for 10 years. And I talked to the best neurologist in the world, and none of them could come up with an explanation that made any sense to me. Uh, because these, this, this, this event, this thing that happens with this guide is, is, you know, is constant. It never, ever goes away. Um, when I, even if I have a seizure, uh, Karen will come and help me with that. The seizure only lasts a few seconds or a minute. If it, can't, if it lasts much longer than that, you're dead. So, uh, so it's not, it's not the seizure itself that would bring on, would bring on the guide. The guide is always with me. And that's something that 
nobody has really been able to explain, and nor am I interested in their explanation for the simple reason that I live my whole life with this guide. The guide has saved my life on numerous occasions because she knows the future. She knows the future, and I have witnesses to this, by the way. And one of the best things to mention about the whole fact is there's no malice from that informational source, is there, towards you? And also holds no judgment against you, even if you decide to try and circumvent what you've been told, which is beneficial to you. No, she never, ever judges anything. Like, when I got out of the army, I was I was in bad shape, and I was drinking a lot, and I would, you know, I would try to get off alcohol, and then I'd go to the bar and get drunk, and then I'd get off the alcohol, and I'd go to the bar and get drunk. Every time I did that, I would feel real guilt, and I would come back, and I'm seeing Caron, and I'd say, you know, I'm really sorry, you know, I didn't, you know, I, I, I didn't, I didn't mean, and she would just say, we're not, we're not going to deal with that. That's, that's not important. We have things to do today. And so there was never any judgment of any kind on anything I did ever. So it, it was remarkable contradiction to Christianity, which has judgment in it. But this being has no judgment about anything. That's a good and- point, which we're going to get to, because there's a nice link to Rick on that one. But obviously, I would like to get to Alexi. Okay. I'm, all right, um, I'm done. Well, no, I'm going to link back because that's a good point. I know that you don't mind me breaking in and doing this. Also, Shadow Fox, Artesian of the Spirit, just had to say that she's been called away and she enjoyed very much the conversation with people as well as meeting Rick, which was great. I know, Melissa, you've got a time limit on where you're going. How much time have you got left with us? Yeah. I didn't hear a word of that. It just glitched in my ear. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I'm a, I'm about to take off because my appointment's in 20 minutes. Okay. Well, I'll let you so, say your um, goodbyes. Then we get to Alexi and then we'll pull it around to the point that I was going to go with Rick. And by the way, if people are not familiar with Rick, I've put his website up into the nest with obviously the guest today and then you can get familiar. So, Melissa, you can do your wonderful exit line that you always do. The one that you love so much. <laughs> No, Um, I just, yeah, I'm just, I'm going to say goodbye. I will see you all soon. Goodbye, community. It was great seeing some old faces pop back and great to always see new ones. Lovely meeting you, Rick. And I'm sorry I couldn't stay. Um, I'm a huge meditation fan. I'm a meditation coach and um, I swear by it. It's my medicine because it helped me get out of depression and severe anxiety attacks. So really wanted to sit here and and listen to, um, to, to the show today. But I really got to go. <laughs> so, um, but it was loving news. So, ciao, everyone, and look forward to seeing you all again. Bye, Bye. Melissa. Yeah. And also, <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. I, was, thought I was over talking somebody at that point. I was also going to say goodbye to Mike as well because he said he's got to run, but it's nice to see him. Goodbye, Mike, if you want to say goodbye, Mike. Bye, Mike. Bye, Mike. <laughs> Bye, Mike. Bye, Melissa. Thank you for coming. Oh, thanks, Rick. <laughs> Hopefully right. we can get you on again soon. Oh, definitely. It's a large topic that we're going to dive into, which is fantastic. And Alexi, thank you very much for your patience. If you want to continue, Alexi, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm uh, on uh, loudspeaker. Uh, so I uh, don't have uh, inner monologue, and I get uh, to there by meditating and some other ways. I don't have spirit guides uh, oh, could I ask you what kind of meditation technique that you use? I want to speak several sentences and then I will answer questions. Okay, great. Continue. Yeah, it's uh, like uh, Paul mentioned uh, mind of mnemonist and one of the way where you come uh, to know inner monologue is uh, you banish egregorials. Like uh, the, the mnemonist... Uh, uh, had uh, some condition where he read some uh, <clears throat> shop sign or some commonly used word, and this will generate noise in his head, and he will just rewrite it. So one of the banishing egregorials is where you try to escape the airwormy qualities of this noise. And sometimes uh, you visualize the noise, so sometimes I hallucinated uh, objects uh, without consciously aware 
that these objects were just generated by making noise out of reading shop signs into objects. And I don't experience uh, deities or spirit guides, which is interesting. And uh, uh, this is my way, like I chose to. And uh, the way I experience uh, some information from different people is sometimes I wake up with music in my head and this music is uh, sounds like music from other countries and sometimes I record it. But uh, other than that, I don't experience uh, information that the source of which I cannot like point to. So yeah, my meditation is uh, either open heart meditation or my meditation is just regular where you see. Could you describe what open heart is? Because I'm not familiar with that. So I just like to put it in layman's terms for people. Yeah. And also I've put into the nest, the book that Alexi was mentioning as well, The Mind of a Nomonist by Alexander R. Luria and uh, the forward by Jerome Brumer. So if you can do that for me, that'd be great, Alexi. Yeah, I can't... Uh... On the, on the spotlight, uh, say precisely the description I will post uh, later, but it's, uh, you. you just uh, uh, have a track uh, that is called Open Heart Meditation, and you listen, and after it, uh, you have some uh, comments that you need uh, to do. It's not about visualization, it's about similar to forgiveness, or something like that. And then other meditations are just regular mindful meditation where you sit and look at your mind like aquarium with uh, fishes, like uh, the thoughts come to you, uh, but you don't serve them tea, something like that, and they uh, go away. But uh, Oh, so you don't give them weight, you just observe them and let the emotional content disappear, yeah? That's the kind of... yeah. Process. I don't think that I'm a monster. I don't uh, think that uh, this threat should be explored uh, because uh, it uh, can't be utilized. So I just uh, go to the next thing or I'll uh, go into writer's block where I don't think anything but uh, how to solve problem at hand. So, yeah, that's it. No, thank you, because that really is adding to the content. And I would recommend people go and either look on YouTube or check out the book that we're mentioning, which is The Mind of a Mnemonist, because he couldn't actually forget anything. So from birth, before he even learned language, he was attaching, for example, in his head, and we do it this way, a string. And every time he saw something, he'd attach it to the string. And if he heard sounds, there would be different colors. And it turns out he had also synesthesia. So when these images were there so for example if there was a standard kind of chair that was around and he saw that but it was also someone was having an argument when he sees another chair which is identical then it will replay the argument that he heard even if that argument was like years and years away he then ended up going to make money via a stage show where they had a chalkboard he'd look away the audience would write down say 30 things and they put it on a board he would then turn around for a second, turn around, they'd erase it, and then he would actually write out the whole content on another chalkboard. He then went off to, I think I've got to get this right, he's a psychologist or psychiatrist, Luria, and he wanted to try and find a way to forget things because he had so much information that was overloading him and causing him issues. And it'd be interesting to know if Rick has actually knows of the book of the mind and the mist or read it. I have no, I haven't. Have you heard about it? Uh, no, it sounds fascinating. So there is also YouTube. People will talk about it as well. But I'm going to put together a set of links, and then obviously I'll email them to you, Rick, so that you've got them afterwards as uh, content. So where Myron was also talking about the fact of yeah, taking... Yeah, I want to ask a question, can I? Okay, yep, sure, do that. Yeah, like the last uh, idea is that uh, Egypt pharaohs uh, used the same uh, method to rewrite their memories, but it's another question, but 
my question for Rick is whether he experiences voices like booming voice, robotic voice, or like his own voice, or the voices of his spirit guides and information come to him in his own voice, or a voice of person he never heard of. Um, okay, yes. Not in a booming voice. Uh, as I was saying, I think someone else asked me about this. It's just kind of thoughts that percolate through my, uh, uh, through my awareness while I'm in, in a state of uh, me- meditative. Uh, and it's rather objective. It's kind of quiet. Uh, it's not... Uh, uh, and, and as people have been saying, never judgmental. Uh, what what I've been thinking, listen to all of these uh, fine comments. You know, I have a guide, and there's something behind it, and I have no idea what's behind. It. Uh, and uh, the other thing, everyone is different, and so the guides that we have in our our life probably the same. Uh, I'm absolutely convinced that the same entity or whatever is behind all this but it it may manifest itself somewhat differently because people are different but um, the same kind of a, a process gentle kind of speaking to me in a quiet voice making suggestions that i think are just uh, very surprising and helpful and uh, I, I just don't think that they come from me they just seem to come from a different source um I don't know if that answered your question, but n- nothing shouts at me. Uh, uh, and it's not in my voice. Uh, and it's not, I don't know that it's really a voice. It's just thoughts come bubbling. I call them my bubble. Thoughts just kind of come bubbling up uh, uh, from somewhere. And uh, uh, so I guess that maybe answer your question. Does it, Alex? Alexi, sorry. Yeah, uh, it answers. Excellent. Before Maybe I get to not Ma- well, but <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those things that before I get to Marin, it's with language, it's just not human language is not very descriptive. Again, whether we do it in art or anything, it's always very just scratching the surface of how this information comes. Again, if you're looking at the scientific point and people say everything's entangled and so many possibilities are out there, maybe the larger source is coming down like a read to each individual so they're not overloaded and they're getting part of that information as it's going along but i'm obviously going to bring up um different pathways to get to that knowledge so myron yeah in my case uh, my throat is just about shot so i'm <clears throat> so bear with me uh, in my case if the if Karen comes to me as a male it's a male voice that talks it's not my voice it's its voice so it's uh, it's audible to my ear or it's inside my head i can't I'm not really sure or or maybe both if it's if she if it's she if it's a she like now caron's a she she has a female voice it's soothing and it's quite wonderful um if it's just a just an, a thing like a, a spirit but has no form the voice is like inside my head and there is no speech the voice that's is, what my that's exactly what mine is I didn't interrupt you, but that's exactly what. Yeah, it's it's always been in those three categories. Um, And I remember when I used to sit in church when I was really young and Karen would start speaking to me in the male voice back then. This was like when I was like 10 or 11. And um, it would be so distracting. I I couldn't even hear the minister. I, I didn't even I couldn't concentrate enough to to uh, comprehend what the minister was saying, because I was more interested in what Karen was saying. But other times, if I was in church, like if I was in the, you know, if I was in the church choir or something, Karen would just be a spirit. Just there would be no voice. And if there was anything that was supposed to be about Jason to me, then it would just come into my brain and be there and uh, communicate whatever it had to communicate. Like for instance, I might be sitting in church and then. Karen would say, after church, I want you to go do this, whatever it is. And because I used to have these places of power that I would go to all every all my life. I, I <clears throat> wherever I, I was a traveling vice president in a communications company. So 
I had to go all over the Western United States. And so every time I went to a new city, I would find a place of power. Sometimes it took a day or two to find it, but I would always find one. And oh, can I, would... I just ask you, Maren, when you say it's a place of power, was it something that made your body tingle or just silence? Or what would you, how would you describe that when you found it? The minute I walked into it was like uh, the emotion of being at home. In other words, this is a place for me. And so it would be it would be just like I was going into my own. And other places aren't like that. It's just a place. But when I go, when I find a place of power, first of all, my allies come to do a little ritual of the place itself. So they come. Uh, when I was in Oregon one time, I was walking around in this wonderful place in Ashland because I was did some music there. And um, the, I was up, and there was there was there was a, there was a waterfall and stuff, and and the and my allies, came, and it transformed the the magic of nature into the magic of the in my inner life, and and uh, they didn't speak, but they were all there, and then Karen began to speak. So, um, so yeah, it it when I find a place of power, like the like I want like the one I found in Ashland. That that waterfall area it was a place of power. <clears throat> and so what that does is it opens up these channels. If I find a place of power, wherever it is, um, it can be in a church. I, I used to go to this Catholic church when no, there was nobody there, of course. And I would sit in the Catholic church because there's both sides of the of the Jungian thing, there's a there's an anima and an animal because there's there's Mary and there's Jesus. So that there's the male female dualism. And so I used to go to the Catholic Church because they were the only ones who had those manifestations. Most churches, nothing would happen. There was one church that I would I went into and immediately I felt connected to my other part, my other self, my other beings, and they appeared. They just appeared in front of me. So they would stay as long as I could stay there. This is when I was working as a tech. So I, I had lunch and I would eat. I would take, instead of eating there, I would I would just go in and, and meditate in the, in, in the church. <clears throat> so uh, sometimes I'm called to go to a certain place. When I was in um, uh, uh, another city, um, Karen would say, I want you to go here. And like she knew the place so it was a it was a um site it wasn't it was a uh christian science monitor park and i'm not a christian science monitor person but the park itself that they had adjacent to the church was very powerful for me so when i went there all of a sudden my allies so that's how it worked it, it, sometimes they select the place sometimes i have to hunt it out and then i then i find it other times it just it just is. And um, so that's, that's been the, the history of it. I'm going to add something for Rick, because obviously Melissa is not here to mention it as well. Because Melissa works with energy, she also has basically a voice sometimes that's literally just outside of her ear, giving her information which she normally wouldn't be able to have about a person. So she wouldn't look up somebody who was coming to talk to her or someone she's next to. It just gives information in a woman's voice and she thinks obviously that's another kind of way that you get this connection with information and the way that the brain is interpreting it is, it, is putting it as a, a female voice and it warned her at one stage about a car that was coming and also at other stages it's also given information about a woman who turned up on her door and she had this feeling before she even opened the door up and knew who was there because she didn't use like a, a a video doorbell or anything like that, that this woman was pregnant. And when she was there talking to her, she goes, well, I think you're pregnant. And she goes, well, I don't think I am. And then the woman later on actually found out she was and then obviously communicated this to her. So it's really quite amazing when this kind of information is provided and you don't know where you're getting the information from. Right. It is fascinating. Well, you know, it, it's also interesting that um, – it's proof to me that these spirit guides know the future. Either the future has already existed or they know the future because Caron has been right. Every single time she has told me something was going to happen, it happened. Uh, and sometimes it would, as benign a thing as the DMV, the, the Department of Motor Vehicles, 
um, she told me some information that that was contradictory to a letter I had from them. And when I got there, she told me that they would they would be ignoring these parts, even though these parts were very important. And they did ignore them. So she already knew that. And one time I was I was in the, in the army. She told she told me I was I was I got off work and and she said, "Do not go to the bar. Do not go to the bar." And she said it loud and clear. And so I turned around and went back to the base. And the bar blew up and killed 27 v- uh, 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 soldiers wow. and, Viet- and Vietnamese as well. So she saved my life there. She also saved my life one time pulling me away when I, when I was very young. I was going to step off a, a, a curb uh, on a green light. And she pulled me back and a car went right around the corner. It did, ran, the red, it ran the red light and went right around. That car would have killed me dead if Caron had not pulled me right back. Um, and and I, used, I used to talk to spirits all the time and it would upset my mother no end. And she would, she would yell at me, what are you doing? And I'd say, I'm talking to this man standing right here. And she couldn't see the man, of course, so, or hear the man. And she would get really upset. And, and I used to get beat up pretty bad about it. And um, but I could see them and I could hear them. And I figured everybody ha- could see them and hear them. Um, because but they, they looked always... like a natural solid object, didn't they? They didn't look like they were no, oh, just looked, transparent. He looked, like, yeah. he looked like a guy who worked there. But yeah, he gonna... knew things about me that nobody could know. Because also that... Anthony was also talking about the guy in his book where he was on a military vehicle as a gunner. And they were going around the corner and he wasn't paying attention to kind of his gut instinct. Then he kind of got pulled out of his own chair and there's nobody there physically there. And where he was sitting as he got around the corner, there was strapped. Um, there was bullets that went through the seat and where he was standing up. And the guy kind of said, it was like someone just pulled me straight out of the seat, but there was nobody around physically to do that. So it's amazing these kind of things that tie in with what Myron is saying, isn't it? Yeah. Not only yeah. not only that, but other soldiers have told me uh, similar stories uh, in combat. Um, I think that that it there there is something that 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 particular event produces in your intuitive side that gives you information if you're listening that will save your life. And it and I I don't know how many soldiers had told me. Yeah, that you know, I I, heard, I just heard a voice say, "Don't do it. Don't go down there." And sure enough, they he didn't go down there, and they dropped a they dropped napalm right there, right where this guy was going to be. So uh, I heard a lot of those. So I think that that what happens is when there's a lot of energy around, uh, especially life and death energy. Sometimes these voices enter. You know, they come they through they come through the barrier of the ego and because Jung was always talking about the, the ego as being the barrier to to uh, growth, and they come through the, the barrier of the ego, and they go they go directly into the unconscious, and then the unconscious tells you, "Don't do that, don't do that." And a lot of De- people a lot of people get those, and they just call them intuitions. He called them intuition as well, but but anyway, there's a good one tying up about information that could have part, already been happening and is available to us. Stephen Hawkins and Herzog, they came up with a theory of which they would call it the top-down theory, but somebody yeah. explained it to me, which if you imagine you've got a cylindrical glass in your hand that's transparent and you've got water in it with a bit of good old washing up liquid and a straw, you blow one bubble. That bubble's one universe with all probabilities. If you continue blowing and a second bubble comes within the first bubble, that's another universe full of probabilities. But if it bursts and touches the first one, then obviously those possibilities have already been merged with the first one. But if you keep doing that for, like, say, 40 different bubbles, and that's 40 different universes of probability, and then you've finally got the last bubble, that last bubble's got all those probabilities in there. And because you're entangled with that bubble, because you exist within that universe, you've got access to that information at certain times if you're paying attention. And it's really fascinating when you kind of look at it that way. I'm not sure, Rick, if you've heard that explanation before or not. I, I, no. Um, my uh, sense, though, is 
that you can hear that better. I can hear my spirit guide better when, uh, you know, I cleaned out some of, uh, of my grievances and anger and all that kind of thing. And I'm in a quiet, meditative uh, uh, perspective of kind of being at peace with myself. Then I hear that voice much more uh, strongly, you know, in my day-to-day hectic life. Uh, that's just how it kind of works for me. Yeah, I mean, I think it works differently for almost everyone. I talk. I hundred percent. It's the same process, but it, it manifests itself differently for different people. I, I absolutely with that. Uh, yeah. When we go to Alexi and he's finished his question, we'll bring it into where you are with your book and the way that you're seeing how people are reacting. And again, with the terminology that would be used later on, it's not trying to offend anybody. It's basically making sure everyone treats everyone as equal and be nice to each other. So Alexi, continue. Yeah, I'm just reminding that Akama's razor is... uh... Uh, you don't create uh, hypotheses. Uh, Occam's without, razor, yeah. Yeah, Occam's razor, without any reason. So if I experience precognition and don't experience deities, uh, why should we explain precognition using deities, moral choices, or escape from death? And uh, there is another person, maybe I will invite him. He... Uh, explained his uh, precognition that uh, he had a dream and there was uh, uh, police coming to make him arrest, to arrest him. And police came. And uh, after that, he started listening to his dreams. So that's my two cents. But my question for Richard is uh, whether he experienced precognition. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Okay. Maybe when you think answers my question <laughs> i haven't done too well with you alexi i apologize <laughs> you can always come back and supply answers and always yeah. contact alexi via obviously direct messaging with that because obviously we wanted to bring it back to how the viewpoint is of gatekeeping being nice to people which comes into how your latest book is being talked about yeah oh okay well because that all connects with this as well yeah, what what my book is is really about is what I've uh, over the course of forty years of doing this kind of I- inner work, and um, you know, as a Christian, uh, I am rather discouraged with the inability of most Christians to uh, have much interest in making the world a better place. I mean. I'm interested in things like nuclear weapons. They threaten the life on the planet, and yet very few Christians seem to be concerned about that issue. Uh, uh, I'm concerned about uh, climate change. I'm concerned about uh, economic inequality in uh, uh, my country. I'm concerned about the fact that politics has become a war. Uh, All these uh, uh, politicians in in, uh, my country claim to be Christian, and yet uh, they can't get along. Uh, If they can't get along, see the greater good of the country, we're not going to survive very well as a democratic state. And in my book, I also look at 2,000 years of uh, Christian history, and it hasn't been particularly impressive. I mean... uh, Anti-Semitism uh, uh, was almost sponsored by the 2000 in Western Europe. Uh, Christians fighting uh, all in the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Uh, the record hasn't been very good. And so what I argue in the book, I say that, you know, most churches probably preach the gospel. But what they don't do is they don't provide the tool for Christians to actually lead a uh, 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 a better life. And so what I'm trying to suggest is that uh, Christians, instead of, you know, doing all their Bible study and all that kind of stuff, really ought to spend more time learning how to meditate uh clearing the windows of their perception so that they can see the world 
from the perspective of other people. So that's basically what my book is about. And, and as I say, it wouldn't have been possible for me to write a book like that unless I had had 40 years of uh, working on uh, myself through mindful me meditation. So that's, I guess, is a summary of what my book is about. Because it's also basically reaching out to others and treating them as you want to treat yourself and not isolating yes, as an ideology. That's, that's right. And and if you don't clean the window, if you don't get rid of your psychological junk, you can't see uh, other people. Uh, uh, you can't see their interests and understand where they're coming from because you get awfully self-absorbed with your own problem. And so... That's what uh, uh, I've kind of learned through my rather long life. <laughs> well, it's good going. I know Myron's got something to add to this, so I'm going to bring him in. Yeah, I was born uh, into the church. Um, <clears throat> in fact, uh, in the nursery in the church, they put baby pictures up of all of the, of the parents who had children in that church. So I was born and raised a Christian. And I was going to go to seminary. In fact, I went to uh, seminary to be a music man. And um, there, there has always there was there was always a problem for me um, with um, the focus that didn't seem very focused on the transcendental material of of uh, connection with the infinite. It just it just didn't seem to be there. And oh, I, I didn't even. Uh... I didn't, I, I didn't even go ahead. Amen. I just, you were right on. I didn't interrupt. Go ahead. <laughs> well, uh, well, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't even understand what I just said. Those were fancy words. But when I was, even when I was young, when I was 10 and 11 and 12, I was seeing visions of all kinds of things that had nothing to do with Christianity. And um, I, I was teaching Sunday school classes and choirs and all kinds of things. And, um, uh, because <clears throat> I was always in the music departments in some very big churches. But then I noticed that in the in, in when I was young, politics and all of that, abortion, all of that stuff was never ever mentioned in church. In the church. Right. I was I was born and raised a Baptist. It never came up. Right. Politics was never discussed. It was always about the scriptures and about the lesson of the morning, whatever that lesson was. Yeah, that's it. And somehow that slipped away into a, a uh, into a political arena. And I think people left the church in droves because of that. Um, I didn't leave because of that. I left because I felt a call to find transcendental consciousness. That's the reason I left. And, uh, and it's the reason I left the seminary and everything else. And um, but I never left the teachings, the basic teachings of the Dead Sea Scrolls, for instance, or even Christ, who said, you know, uh, you only had to do really two things. Uh, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul and all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. That was all you had to do. That was it. Those two things. is all, So I, 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 all right, all right, I can do those. Things. So but it took me. <laughs> took me 50 years to forgive all of the people that had hurt me, including my parents who hurt me really bad. But when I finally got to a place, when Karen finally got me to a place where I was ready to let go, because um, I had tried to forgive. And, and you know, when, when in the Old Testament, when God says, you know, that, that he forgives, he means he will metaphysically forget that this thing ever happened. In other words, he's omniscient, so he always knows everything that ever happened. But according to the Bible, when he forgives, he makes himself forget that you ever did any of these things. And so quick question to reckon yourself. Obviously, you've taken this time period to learn that. If you had learned it back when you were in your 20s, do you think it would have made a difference or do you think you needed all the experiences throughout your life, good and bad, to make it relevant now? I couldn't do it in my 20s. I was so bitter, angry about the war, about the government, about about what they were doing in the churches. I was so angry with my parents. I, I was just full of rage. And 
Caron worked with me f- for decades and decades to get over it. And when I was about 50 plus, one day I got up and I went to the mountain and just just a normal day. And all of a sudden I felt it all go. And then Caron said to me, you know that you have to forgive everybody, everything. That's right. I mean, everything, everything that ever happened. You know, you know, they talked about it in AA when I was in, you know, when I was in AA about forgiveness, I blew it off. But when Caron said to me, this is, this is going to be difficult, but you're going to have to forgive everybody and everything that includes governments, that includes your parents, that includes the, how you were raised, that includes the affliction that you have, that includes everything. You're going to have to forgive the universe for everything. And when I was, when I was able to accomplish that, the world just completely flipped over. I, I, I don't know how else to describe it. I don't feel animosity towards anyone about anything. <laughs> Is that the same way that it went for yourself, Rick? Or do you well, think if you had learned it earlier, then you would be different? Or, you, again, did you need this for life experience? Okay, I can answer both ways. For me, it was very much like with Myron. It took a long, long time to get over some of my issues. Um, but for some people, like the Apostle Paul, it was kind of instantaneous. He had such a I gather a fantastic encounter with the, with the divine on, on the domestic road. It kind of cleared all his junk right out of his system. For me, it, you know, it's been 40 years of working on my issues, but I've come to the same place, a place of peace and forgiveness and, uh, 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 yeah, feeling very, feeling very different and seeing the world very different. Um, as the Buddha says, you know, uh, I, I just see the world with new eyes now. Um, and, and But it's for me, it's been a journey. Um, I, I think for most people, it's a journey. I think even for Paul, um, I think it was a journey. And, you know, there are a lot of neurologists that that road to Damascus event was a seizure. I know. I've read that, too. And, and the, evi- the evidence is pretty, pretty conclusive. People going blind for a few for a few days and stuff is not uncommon with with epilepsy. It's yeah. just not common. Right. And 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 remember, you know, I mean, Paul was was a Roman citizen and uh, he was a big guy. I mean, he was a big shot and brilliant, obviously. And uh, he wrote two thirds of the New Testament, at least the ones that's canonized. And, um, uh, but, you know, he never met Christ. He never, you know, he, he claimed that he saw a vision of him on the road to Damascus. But if you think about it, if you read the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are more Gnostic, you get more Christ information than you do in the Bible. The Bible, you don't get very much uh, information directly from Christ. You get a lot of teaching, but you don't get a lot of his words, you know, and if you, if, um, if you read if you read the Dead Sea Scrolls and and those those Gnostic texts, you you get a lot of kind of Buddhist mysticism. No, you're right. I totally agree with that. And it and that I see. I believe, and then I'll shut up. <laughs> I believe that that um, we we're connected to the entire universe, and I call it what Buck called it, cosmic consciousness, and. I think that cosmic consciousness is total love with no conditions attached, period. Because anything that has conditions can be weighed one way or the other. I don't think there is, I don't think that, I don't think that specific love has any conditions of any kind. Because when I, when I experience it, which I do from time to time directly, there is no, there is no condemnation there's no, uh, there's no confusion. There's no duality. It's all one thing, um, uh, and it's and it's eternal. It has always been here. It'll always be here. But so, l- let me just ask you though: 
but it's taken you a while to come to that understanding, right? You had to get rid of your anger and all that kind of stuff before you could kind of see the world in that way. Oh, absolutely. I, uh, yeah. I tried so, and tried and tried and failed. Yeah. So in, in that sense, our processes are really very... Um, I mean, maybe I mean, maybe that's... there are people who can do it, you know, like boom, like that. I, 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 I yeah. haven't read I haven't read the biography of anybody who's been able to do that. Yeah. Uh, Mil- Milarepa, who is a big uh, Hindu guru, he went through all kinds of, of craziness to become enlightened. And it almost destroyed his life. And then he finally let go because the ego does not want to let go. I mean, right. you know, Jung was always talking about, you know, when you're young, you want to build an ego so you can have a life. And then when you have the life and you get the ego, then you spend the rest of your life trying to get rid of it. <laughs> and uh, and I agree with him totally because, yeah, you I know, agree without, too. as long as you're connected to to the ego, you're not connected to the self. And if you're not connected to the self, you cannot you cannot experience this unconditional love that is in the universe. You can't do it. I, you're I, blocked I, yourself. I absolutely with that. Yeah. Something I'd also like to throw into the pot there, because obviously having to release all of that to get into a, a better flow, some of the people, and again, this is from the experiences that I've seen and talked to, and we use it like a hypothetical, you hang on to that kind of anger about what someone's done to you, but that person who's done that to you, they've completely not, they've not hung on to it at all. It's just gone in the moment of when they've done it to you, and you may still have it for years to let go. And that's one of the strangest things that you've got the better moral set, but the person who has done that and wronged you has literally gone on smiling and happy, you know, and they've got no issues. No. It doesn't matter what they think. And, you know, like, for instance, I had I also had to do this for the army, for the government and for the present government and any governments of any kind. Um, I You can't you can't pick and choose because the minute you pick and choose, you're blocking your own ability to let go. You you can't have it both ways. You can't hold grudges against Hitler and have eternal and have complete love. You can't do it. Yeah. Now I, you can you can judge his moral from an ethics point of view. You can judge him as a, a as you know not judge him, but you can you can uh, uh, hold him accountable for what he did. Like, but you you can't. There is no hell for Hitler. Hitler was already there in hell. So people don't under. I don't think people understand. You know the the concept of good and evil in a in a gnostic way or even even in a uh, metaphysical way you know uh, it's part of a dualism that exists only on this plane of existence it doesn't exist in the other plane of existence because it can't you can't have a dualism in in unity you can't have good and bad in a unity that i'm sorry it just doesn't work and no teacher I know of in the East, and I'm talking about Hinduism and Buddhism, teaches that you can have all the dualisms are in karma, are in this dimension. They're not in the other dimension. If you're if you're enlightened, those all that goes away. It isn't even relevant to anything. I agree. And that's why it's, I think it's that's why I went to from Christianity was for that. And then I had to let that go. You know, there's a famous book. If you beat, if you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him. I don't know if you've read that book, but I've heard of it. It's well, a good one. It, yeah. What it basically says is, yeah, you have to become the Buddha yourself. I mean, <laughs> when you meet the Buddha, you have to it. You have to transform yourself into the Buddha. So the Buddha has to. That Buddha has to die, and you become the Buddha. And they teach that. And in, in I, I, I was in China, and I was in a a. a a very, very, very powerful uh, place of teaching uh, for Tibetan Buddhism uh, in in Beijing. And I was talking to one of the priests there, uh, one of the senior, what they call, they have a name for him. And and we were talking about this and he was he was emphatic that he could not hate the Chinese. He could not put any energy in that direction because there was nothing 
in the little in his in his container of experiences that would allow him to have that feeling. The uh, Dalai Lama said the same thing. He cannot hate the Chinese, you know, and he's on a death list. If he yeah. goes to China, they will kill him. And he still won't talk negative against. I mean, that kind of representation of the beauty of pure love is just monumental. And just going to bring Alexi in because he's got a question, which I think probably is okay, going to yourself, and, Myron. And Paul, I, I need to go fairly. Soon. Okay. How long have you got so that I can tell people to put their hands up? Uh, maybe uh, 4 30, my time. I don't know what the time is, but basically 11 minutes right so okay. if we can get everything done within seven that'd be superb yeah because you got on half hour yeah on the half hour you need to go but if we can do it in seven minutes or less Rick? that'd be fine yeah okay alexi yeah i am just uh, want i wanted to answer the question of uh, if someone used verbal abuse against you <clears throat> he just uh, has less trust in the world than you I think, but yeah, let other people ask the question. Okay, Jade. Hi, um, I just wanted to, I don't, I had questions, but um, I've also been very busy multitasking with work right now with um, babies. Um, so I've just really enjoyed listening. I really appreciate your perspective, Rick. Um, I grew up in a Christian, like religious home and then, um, decided I was, it, it didn't really fit my, like, um, developing, like, beliefs and narrative and when I was in college, and then I was kind of identified as an atheist for a minute, but then got into Alan Watts and other things, like, never really felt like an atheist, but, um, and now I'm just kind of seeking and, and looking, um, I don't know, just, just figuring, figuring it all out. But um, definitely appreciate the insights that you shared. And I'm going to be looking at your book. And I wish I remembered the question I had earlier. <laughs> because, uh, um, but hopefully, hopefully um, you'll be able to join us again for another conversation in the future. And um, I will write down my question in the meantime. So I will not forget next time. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> so if anybody's got a quick question that they want to get in there, we've got four minutes or less. So if you've got your hand up, that would be superb. In the meantime, I would say, ah, oh, great, D. So um, I, I've been here listening to Myron and, and Rick. Thank you, guys, both of you. Um, I, too, come from a Roman Catholic background and have gone into deep studies of Buddhism and Hinduism. I've studied deeply into Hinduism. But I love the, it, it was a long journey for me, myself. Um, there's There was a lot of chaos and a lot of disconnection and trying to figure things out as I think being in a part of the Catholic religion kind of just left you sitting on the surface with no depth. And going into the depth process took me into my, by my night of, you know, my dark night of the soul. So it was really, really intense. Um, but I'm, I'm, yeah, I just wanted to share that. Well, thank Rick? you. Yeah. Thank you. I, I mean, we all kind of have that dark night. I think those experiences really do mold you and help yeah. you later on to help they, other people at the same time. So, Jade, I'll quickly squeeze you in, and then obviously then we'll say our goodbyes. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. I remembered. Um, I guess, like, as you um, – your consciousness is, is changed through the practice of, like, meditation and these other mindfulness like practices, and then – I, I don't know if this is something that you feel is like also kind of um, more distant from some of the like political or just other dramas in society and around us um, that are happening, like in some ways, like one, maybe less, you know, judgmental and more compassionate, but like, how do you maintain like empathy and compassion for what's going on around us? um in those spheres even when like maybe there's an understanding that it's all going to you know either work out in the end or this is all just an experience and not something to get too hung up on but like you know 
um, suffering and, and things are real too. I don't know if that makes sense. It's, well, what I do I don't is know. I kind of work to change things if I can more in line with, with, you know, my spiritual sense of, of where, uh, uh, uh I'm kind of, I, I think that, uh, that you get messages uh, about politics, just like all the messages you get in life. And my messages are kind of encouraging me to work for peace, to work for economic and social justice, to do those kinds of things. So um, I don't get discouraged. I just work. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to say one, one last thing, and that is I think that, that uh, there's never been a time in the world where the world has been at peace. Think about it. The last right. century, millions and millions and millions and millions were killed in the last century. And in the century before that, millions and millions and millions were killed in war in that century and on and on and on and on. So I think that you have to take on um, what you can do for yourself to transform yourself before you know, get the get the log out of your own eye, be the speck out of your brother's. Eye. I and, told, I'm with you a hundred percent. You're absolutely. I mean, there's never been a time of peace and harmony. It's never existed. Never. Look at history. Study history. Read all you want. Yeah. And you won't find it. It isn't there. And people have this this mythology that there's a that there was this time of, you know, of, of peace and harmony and blah, blah, blah. Well, there has never been such a thing. But there's always been people, monks and spiritual seekers and all the rest, who have transcended that. And what else can you do? You know, I mean, ultimately speaking, there's the, the, you have a choice of being bitter, angry, or whatever. But the truth is that if you want to transcend that, it's it's a personal thing you must do yourself definitely i'm just going to cut in there because obviously we're getting very close to time i know tamara got kicked out and came back in requesting the speaker did you have a question or something to say tamara oh i was just running the uh the faucet i didn't hear you <laughs> <laughs> you requested the microphone to, to run the water at us. Oh, no, I no. appreciate that. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I've been bumped off. I think this is the third time. Okay. So it's I nice that you got back. <laughs> well, did you want to say anything to Rick before he runs away and we say our oh, goodbyes? Um, I, I'm, uh, I can't think of anything right now. You could always say thank you very much and then we can just sort of kick him out the door in a minute because yeah, he needs to run away soon. Ask me a question. Oh, no we can't do a question. We've only got literally three minutes left with Rick. So, yeah. uh, Rick, have you experienced uh, something supernatural or hallucinated a person? One more time, say that again. He was saying, have you ever hallucinated a person? No, I don't. I haven't. Okay, so on that point, does anybody want to say goodbye to Rick? And if no one says anything, I shall come round and poke you to say things, because I'm going to say thank goodbye, you very Rick. much. It's been it's been great, and uh, I hope we get to talk again. I have to well, say thank you very much for putting up with all the technical issues that we had. It's been fantastic. Well, thank you. I have had just a wonderful experience with all of this. So once we got going, I said pretty well. <laughs> Good oh, job, my... Paul. Definitely. And I think you've probably seen areas that you might like to come back and have topics on and expand on as well. Because once we get this finally edited, obviously, it will be more of a tighter conversational piece. But the content that everyone's brought to the table has been fantastic for contemplation to look off into other areas, I think. You know, yeah. this is live on YouTube. Yeah, I know. I'm going to edit I'm it, obviously. I'm watching it. That's why I know. That's good. That's so that Rick can watch it back later before I get to edit it, which will take a few more months, and then I'll get it out there. So <laughs> you can have the comedy special, which is the live YouTube one, or you can have the properly edited one, which actually sounds like we're doing something. <laughs> anyway, once again, thank you very much, Rick. Oh, well, thank you for having me. I just had a wonderful afternoon. And the best thing is to promote his website is one word, rickherrickauthor.com, and then go and have a look at his books. And obviously, you can send him emails or connect through, obviously, Twitter space here or other ways. Rick, are you on Facebook? Uh, not really. Okay. I can pass an email address to you if you want. 
Yeah, yes, please do. Yes, please do that. Yeah, send me an email with that, would you, Paul? Yeah, I'll do that. So I'll get that all sorted out. So anybody else who wants to do that, obviously just get in contact with me and I can obviously pass the information and do it that way because that will probably be faster than through Twitter at the moment. But I think on your website, you've got connection points, haven't you? Rick? Yes, I do. Yeah. Yeah. So the website address is in the shared section above, which also works. So that will work. So once again, thank you very much for participating and coming and hopefully you will come back again and we will talk about other topics well thanks again for having me no bye it's bye. been fantastic sorry Moran, i overcut you i just said bye bye <laughs> unfortunately twitter has a few glitches at the moment so it sounds sometimes words get missing in action as we go along that's why it gets a bit peculiar so once again thank you very much and i will pass out the email address of yourself oh devi nice to see you there we'll probably wrap up in another 10 minutes or so so when rex has gone we'll talk about him but he will actually find out the good information that we'll be discussing about him how we've found different areas to look at yeah that's a good idea actually and uh yeah I'm just going to give access to Debbie if she wants to have a quick chat with us. So when you're leaving, Rick, you will obviously get the emails that I sent you about the book and other bits and pieces, which should be good. And where is it? There we go. So hopefully you had a good time. I had a great time. Thanks again. It's an experience. You don't normally get this kind of thing in <laughs> other places. <laughs> You don't get this kind of expertise out there in the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's basically me spinning plates and trying to make sure they don't crash at different locations, mainly from what I feel at this end of the technological front. But uh, always good fun. So have a good rest of your day, Rick. And we will obviously see you later. And hello, Terry, as you've just arrived. And also, Debbie, I'm not sure whether you had the opportunity to pick up the invite that's there sent to you, which is good. And Estevel, Estevel, a long time no see. Nice to catch up with you. Hopefully you have the opportunity to pick up the mic when I throw it to you. And um, Miro, I haven't spoken to you for a while. Okay, Paul, I'm going to sign up. Okay, once again, yeah. thank you very much. Okay, bye-bye. Bye, Rick. Bye. Bye. Hey, Paul, is there any interference? Uh, if you have, if I have on uh, my laptop this this program, and then I'm I'm, but I'm using my phone to talk to you because I can't use my laptop. Is that interfering with the transmission? No, I'm not getting any distortion. The only distortion I get is if, say, for example, somebody else in the room has their mic not muted. Oh, oh. Then that person's audio sometimes causes an issue coming across. Right. So, okay. like you and me talking now is fine because we both got unmuted. But if there's a third person and there's something going on in the background there, then that can interfere if they're scraping their finger up and down the microphone or other like water running in a faucet, etc. I mean, like for instance, right now I have YouTube up. I've had YouTube up uh, for about, oh, about 20, 30 minutes. That's and good. I'm not hearing it, so that's fine. So that didn't that didn't interfere with anything. So no, it's all great. right. Okay, okay. I was just trying to see what the heck the problem was. Um, I don't know. We've had those things before, but the best thing is that we got great content of conversation once we got through all those hoops that we were getting yeah. through, which is good. Terry, nice to see you. How are you, Terry? You're very quiet on your audio. Oh, you sound like you're two miles away and the microphone's over that direction. I presume it's the same for anybody else that's listening to Terry yes. tomorrow. Yeah, She's yeah. Miles away. Yeah. <gasps> Devi, you've picked up the microphone. Didn't see. How are you? Uh, no, no. I was just going to say, yeah, she sounded far away. Um, but You've just taken the wax out of my ears. Thank you. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I'm sorry I missed this. It's always kind of up and down when it comes to schedule-wise because sometimes it's like feast or famine. Sometimes I have all the time in the world and there's no spaces I want to jump into, and sometimes I have all the time in the world and there's no spaces still. And then sometimes I have no time in the world, and there you guys are. Uh, so I just wanted to hop in. Uh 
Yeah, it's nice of you to be here, yeah, which is good. Yeah, and uh, we're going to continue. Uh, I'll just share this because this is important. It was what I told Buddha Alpha was something that I kind of imagined. I also kind of imagined it for my only fans, but it just didn't work out. Uh, where I just wanted a whole bunch of very intellectual, spiritual people getting together and by intellectual, I mean this, okay? I mean, we can talk as gods would. As in, I'm not going to try to sell you my belief system, BS. <clears throat> You're not going to try to sell me yours. But we are going to exchange ideas. Oh, thoughtful discussion, yes. And so definitely. I had this dream, <laughs> and it actually took place in the Buddha Alpha spaces. And... Uh, what happened was that he's moving on to doing other things. And so we're going to continue it going at 10 a.m. Monday through Thursday. So I just wanted to share that because... Yeah. We're not familiar with Buddha Alpha, so <laughs> that's kind of leaving me blank. You're going to have to describe uh, he's Buddha just, Alpha uh, as a person. He's just an awesome little kid, is what I called him. Uh, I have allergies that are going mad in Florida, especially since I worked in my garden. But... Yeah, he's uh, 25 and knows, I think, and understands. That's the key word. He understands. Terry Lightfoot. Is that Buddha Alpha Healing? Yes. Terry, Terry Lightfoot can vouch for this. He just, he's 25, but he knows everything that it took us about 20 to 25 years to figure out. And that's because you're a crystal child. You just came into this world and just as consciousness is evolving we are a product of consciousness and so our children should have higher consciousness than we and so it's it's just a beautiful time and uh every time you were in that space it was just super awesome so i'm just here to say we'll be going on monday through thursday and i'll be trying to catch all of yours because uh there's another spiritual community that's about, it's my way. It's my way. There's no other. And there's other spiritual communities that are like, this is 1999. You do this and you'll be saved forever. And there are other conspiracy theories and all this stuff. But you know what I loved about this group and which is why I became involved with it and why I love you is because it's about sharing ideas. It's like, don't, don't worry about it. Don't try to convince me about yours. Let me just learn yours and see what parts of yours I can incorporate intellectually, logically, emotionally into mine. And sometimes we may not. And that's okay. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, thank you for saying that yeah. because it is all about just seeing where it falls. Yes. And what serves the collective? That's what we mean by spirituality. I don't know if, you know, what serves the collective? What serves all of us? Maybe me teaching this might not serve the collective. So I hold back and I'll save that for the people whose mouths are open for it. But right now, it's a key time to serve the collective. So uh, I'm just saying we're going to be there 10 a.m. And uh, I love you so much. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much. I mean, I've been trying to, well, if people want to look up the person you're recommending, again, if you just type into the search box on Twitter, it's Buddha and then space alpha. But the actual Twitter ID is, and then Buddha alpha, one word, and then 432 as a number. Yeah, the frequency. Yes, that's it. That's it. So that's the individual. Terry, you wanted to say something? How do I sound now? Can you hear me? Oh, you sound good. I just was switching through and put myself on mute while I was looking at who was requesting something. So that's why I was slow. Yes, no, the audio is good now. Good. Okay, cool. Um, hi, everybody, all over again. <laughs> Thanks for the space. Um, I'm sorry that I, I missed most of it, but uh, I just wanted to bring up that there have been golden ages in the past where everybody was telepathic, everybody you know, understood each other and everybody understood that we were one consciousness. 
um, according to Hindu and Indian, let's just say Indian sacred texts, okay, and that there's a cycle that the Earth goes through where as it travels through the galaxy, it comes into uh, contact with certain energies in certain areas that affect our consciousness. That's what they say in the texts and stuff, and that right now we're like beginning to go on the upward turn again towards higher consciousness again and eventually it will lead to a golden age so according to these texts yes in the past there were times where there has been peace total peace so i'm just throwing that out there it's called the yuga chakra si system uh, or uh cycle uh, and it's a cosmic cycle that the earth goes through and there's periods of total unconsciousness where mankind believes that all there is is matter. And that's when we're totally lost. And then that eventually sort of clears up, et cetera. And then it goes through the whole cycle. And those are like each phase of the cycle lasts 24,000 years. So like the, the dark age is 24, uh, 42,000 years, sorry. And uh, something like that. I can't remember numbers, but, and then there's a silver age, a, a bronze age and a silver age, and then the golden age. And then it goes back down to silver, bronze, and then there's that dark age again. And then it starts all over again. So, I mean, I don't know if that's true or not, but there are texts that speak to it and speak about it. And they're very deep texts. So someone was very clear about it. So I, I'm not saying it's true or not, true, but um, it's out there. Oh, definitely. I mean, we obviously realize that civilizations rise and fall and information is lost and gathered as we go through it. So until proven or disproven, I've just given you the other link in your direct message about what <laughs> on YouTube where it all started. So you could listen back to it if you want to listen to the chaos that we were having prior with technology, which is always funny on our side, which we've had. And Mariah, you've now made it back without being knocked out of the room again, haven't you? Uh, for a minute, it looks like. <laughs> you have to get everything in in a quick 60-second burst before suddenly that door slams shut, and then we have to bring yeah. you back in again. I find it so interesting that Elon Musk can have a space with 2,000 people in it and not one glitch. So, so. In, in my opinion, if we're having a space such as this, that people are discussing their true path, their truly highest good in this lifetime and the work it takes for that, that we're going to get squashed. Nobody like wants this kind of energy getting out. <laughs> and uh, just on a weird note, um, I believe it was uh, Devi was saying something about what serves the collective. And I have a little saying and it's all roads lead to the center of the city, which means whatever path it is for you to reach your highest good, then in that space, we are all in our highest good and working for and with the collective consciousness. Because I don't feel that it's outside of ourselves. I believe that everyone has their own inner path and mine has gone from Methodist, Presbyterian, Christian, to Buddhism, to exploring the dark arts and magic. And it is the totality. And in the totality, we are more than the sum of our parts. So I just wanted to say affirming with what I'm hearing and loving you all and way to hang in their perception because it's been a wild ride. <laughs> I appreciate all that. And it is, as most people have found out through all their hard journeys, it's a personal journey of growth and where they're going through and the things that happen, but also trying to help others at the same time, which is fantastic. And yes, we, <laughs> we do persevere when it comes down to these conversations. The energy is kind of... Uh, chaotic as it goes but it's superb with how people do want to come together and tell their life experience and how it matches up with others no matter what the culture is Debbie 
Well, I just want to say sometimes, and, and in saying this, I honor the people that I work with. I don't like to call people students because if they don't do the work, I don't do anything. So I always uh, like push this. And yesterday I was really, my patience was uh, very little, but I, I told so many of them, I said, you know, how long are we going to keep tweeting Marcus Aurelius and Socrates? How long? And I think it has to do with what Terry Lightfoot said, maybe till the end of this era. And then you will have this majestic new set of tweets. But when you really think about it, this is where I'm at because I've been in this for about 30 years as far as like, I, I, I don't believe I ever had to wake up. I just believe I stayed awake. Uh, and so, so just keeping it going, it, it, just imagine, like I went through all these quotes on MySpace. I, I'm like rehashing my quotes now. I'm like, let me just go to Facebook 2011. Let me just share this one again. That's, that's how it's been lately. And uh, we're a new breed. And so if you're still here and your whole life has been about something more, it's a calling. It's a really deep calling, no matter who you are. You, go be a Jewish rabbi. Go be a great, you know, interpreter of the Kabbalah. Go be, you know, whatever. But, but this is my big question, perceptions. How much longer do I have to see Albert Campus, Socrates, uh, you know, Einstein, uh, so many people requoted. When are we going to have our quotes? And, and I, that's what I challenge people, like call that a TikTok challenge, like I say. But we have so much to share and we need to share it now. Definitely. definitely. I think there's more of an evolution yeah. of people doing things rather than just throwing quotes out there and expecting what, what should we say, validation or popularity from it? Because obviously if you've got think tanks like these little groups that turn up and they actually want to look at it, no matter how much I've tried to back away and not do things, I've always been pushed towards this direction to exploration. And again, like yourself, you've probably found that in your existence, you've ended up connecting people to others who then gave them information. It wasn't the fact that they needed you to solve their issue. It was the fact they needed you to get to know somebody that could help them. And But you weren't looking to be standing on there as a pedestal, but you just had the facility to be able to do that and go, okay, I know this person, let's connect them up and do that. Or this is the information you require. And that's, in my eyes, kind of like the better thing to do is if you can be a facilitator to help somebody else and put them in the right position to either look at something, whether it's good or bad for them, you know, it's the way it goes. But then again, I have to have other people's viewpoints on this. What do you think, Debbie? Well, for me, it's like that is the great big old quote that serves this. Do not fear your greatness. And I think that's something that like we feel like, well, if I share this greatness that I have within me, are people going to think that I want all this for everybody? No. I just want to share this greatness. I just want to pour out of me and you just pour out of you and we'll just add all this to all the really good stuff. And, and that's not what we're taught, but that is why even in the Bible, it says you must leave all that you know behind. That is why so many other philosophies say it's not going to be what you were taught. And there is a ripping away of of philosophies and ideologies and no it does not make sense right away but oh. we're going like star trek where no man has gone before at least right here where we're at right here where we're at we're going to where no man has gone before oh, and so it's going to be scary it's yeah. not meant to be easy. That's yeah. the thing that I've learned throughout life, that whatever you're doing, it's going to be a tinge of fear and it's not going to come off first time round as far as I kind of see things in that way. Myron? I think that, you know, that in all realms, um, that, that other lady was saying that 
that uh, there there's been times of peace and harmony and all the rest. That's really not true. Uh, there's always been groups and movements and um, in enlightened masters. That's always uh, even back to shamanism. But um, but besides that, I think that that uh, I think most people forget that that uh, this is an individual process that they're on. It has nothing to do with the collective. It has to do with them individually. Uh, even Christ taught that, that, you know, that, you know, you must follow your own bliss. And if you don't do it, then nothing is going to change. You can read all the books in the world. You can go to all the groups. You can do whatever you're going to do. But it still comes down to your personal decision making on what you want, what you want. Uh, and after after all of this is said and done, all of this chaos of because uh, that's the main teaching of Buddhism, that this is chaos. Then since the first principle of Buddhism is pain, um, when all this chaos is transcended, which means that it's kind of like nirvanic state or heaven or whatever word you want to use, then when you're in that state, like say the Dalai Lama probably is, then all of these dualisms that go away, just go away. And there is peace, like the songs, like the Beatles, you know, there's peace and harmony and all the rest of it in the 60s. But there's no peace and harmony in the struggle itself because the struggle itself creates chaos and out of chaos unfortunately that's plato and and socrates out of the out of the chaos comes a kind of thirst for truth and love and a better world um i think we're this is this is some information that i probably shouldn't be saying but i think we're in a very dark age we've been in dark ages before uh, the Middle Ages were certainly dark, but I think we're living in a very dark age because the whole of man is transforming from one kind of being to another. AI is going to change change humanity totally, and what comes out of that is going to be what's going to be so important about this transition into AI is what do the individuals that live through that do with their own souls because i won't be here when that happens you know because i'm an old man and i i'm going to be long gone i'll be i'll be with my spirit guides but the fact is that that ai is going to change everything that we ever knew and that's happened before you know that that you know that there was a time when the church said that if you had an English translation of the Bible, you would be burned at the stake. All right. So we've come from that. And that was only 500 years ago to you can read the Bible. Anybody can read the Bible now anytime they want to. So anyway, the point of it is, is, is that that first of all, I think that it's, it's always an individual journey. Always. Christ taught that. Buddha taught that. Muhammad taught that. Everybody has taught that. It's, a, it's an individual quest. And it, and you have enormous po responsibilities and you have enormous possibilities of changing you. And if you change you, you can change others, but you can't change others until you change you. And even you can't eat, and then you don't even have the right to change them. They have to, you just have to give them the information and they either change or they don't change. But anyway, uh, I think that, I think we're in a dark age and a confusing age because we're going from one kind of technology to another, which is going to change the whole world. Um, I remember that even Bill Gates, pardon the expression, but Bill Gates said, you know, that in the 19th century, in the 20th century, we were a century of cable and now we're a, we're a century of data. And so the data century is going to completely transform how everybody sees every um and you can see the chaos in the youth that is in the and in the universities that is so 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 destructive but in that chaos comes comes the opportunity to change and grow and become something greater like this other lady was saying i agree that that we always have the possibility to become something greater and remember there are a lot of physicists who who 
realize that we're not smart enough to know the answers to the universe, and they admit it. So these are the Nobel Prize winners. So it, it isn't a matter of abandoning something or, or adding or subtracting. It's a matter of accepting, you know, the responsibility of every individual in every time that they live in. You know, I mean, I lived in the 20th century. Most of my life was a century. This, this time of the 21st century has been wonderful to me as far as my art and all that stuff. And it's also given me the opportunity to be free of all of the anger that I have. So for me, it's a golden age. But for most people, it's not a golden. It's, a, it's an age of chaos and, and terror and, and, and the potential for a complete metamorphosis of, of society. But I don't feel that way because I'm on my way to, <laughs> to the next thing. And so I'm not so concerned about that. But I just wanted to make the point that, that uh, uh, always, always there has been places where people have have done wonderful wonderful things with with their unconscious and their consciousness and their you know their and their transpersonal conscious but it's never been universal that's that's never happened certainly not in 42,000 years that's certainly not happened so i just wanted to make that point that i'm not saying that there wasn't a time or haven't been time when there have been pockets of brilliant, because you can trace them just by the literary trace of what was written down. Could, can you imagine what wasn't written down? How, imag- how wonderful that must have been, some of those people. The Library of Alexander. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, wow, like, yeah, yeah like that. So anyway, I, 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 I understand, you know, that, 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 you know, you have to take from all books, including the Bible, what is really pertinent to your time and not just throw the baby out with the bathwater. I'm not a Christian, but I still read them. And, um, it, and it isn't a, and it isn't a judgment. I'm not judging anybody's, ex, anybody's experiences or how they believe or what, what gets them through the day or anything else. It's none of my business. Uh, my business is universal consciousness. And as long as I keep focusing on that, then I've done what Karen has asked me to do. And I think that if people follow their bliss and their, and their spirit guides, then they don't have to worry about the future or being alone or any of those things. They, it all comes to them. It just comes to them and has always done that. That's what all, the, that's what all these books are about. If you read them, um, it, it's, it's, an, it's, it's amazing that people read all of these wonderful books and then they, they don't live it. I, I just don't understand. I, I do understand really why they don't, but because there's a big cost to it. But anyway, that's my last rant for the day. Since I didn't get in the, the early stuff, I had to put my last rant at the end. And that's a very good rant to actually get to, which is superb. And I am a fan of rants now and again. We're going to have three well, and we're just going to have four questions, and hopefully we can finish it by in the next 15 minutes, which would be superb. So on the list is Maya, and then obviously we have Alexi, and then we have Terry. Hi again. I just wanted to add a couple of things that I am getting these hits from as I'm listening. And I've noticed through this conversation that all of our gods and all of our mentions of quotes have all been masculine and i truly believe that this supposed dark age right now or golden age is the time of integration and it's integrating the masculine with the feminine for thousands of years the masculine energy has led this planet in government in religion and I truly believe that with the integration will come a balance that has never been seen, that we will take it from a dualistic universe into a unity. And I, the technology thing, it's already happening and our human bodies cannot deal with this level of electronics. There are comparisons 
of the Spanish flu coming out with naval technology and radar and sonar. So without getting off onto that tangent to think about, and I invite you all to see and overstand, not so much understand, but to overstand that each human has within them the feminine and the masculine energy. One is receptive, the other is outgoing. I personally, as a woman, tend to have more masculine energy, with the exception of this last year that I've had the cancer and all that happy shit. But um, I invite you to integrate the feminine with the masculine within yourselves. And that could possibly lead us to something that we have never seen or experienced. It could be magnanimous beyond our understanding or overstanding. So I just wanted to throw that in and thank you, Myron, Terry, uh, Rick, Perception, all of you have helped me in my journey today and I hope that I've helped enlighten yours. Much love. Well, thank you. And also, it's great to see from your bio that you have got remission on what you've been going through, because that is a hard journey, no matter what. Yes, it was very hard. It was stage four of the liver, lungs, wow. and the bones. So I'm now in physical therapy. My spine is straightening back up. And honestly, it was the chemotherapy and my will to live that got me through this. So... That Thank is you. really impressive. I mean, you normally hear horror stories from that particular stage and, oh, how should we say, profusion through the body. Yeah. So we we'll go on to Alexi. Yeah, I want to talk about migraines. Like they are uh, characterized by seizing of neuronal activity and... Like, Myron is uh, in uh, his golden age, and I wish, uh, like, he would share information that could be actually helpful to me. Like, uh, uh, what will my improvement be? Will I uh, dream of deities? Will I have uh, platitudes uh, resonating in my head? Will, ya, will I visualize, like, uh, pastoral views, like, this is why I'm here. Like, what useful information can, can this group uh, give me to improve, uh, uh, like, uh, uh, when neurons uh, cease their activity? Like, I think uh, during epilepsy, uh, there is a completely different process involved. Yeah, that's just thoughts uh, that I speak. Hello, at loudly. So, Alexi, are you talking um, best description as cortical sensory migraines? Yeah. Uh, this uh, uh, we can call them that, but nobody calls them uh, like optical. They are called sometimes. Okay, I'm not sure if Myron's got a quick answer on that or not or he could actually contact you via email with information on this? Actually, the, the thing you should do is get Oliver Sacks' books on migraine. Uh, they're available, and, and he covers he covers the subject from A to Z. It's, it's a brilliant book on migraine. And Anthony uh, 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 recommended it uh, a long time ago, but I, I, got it, I got it directly from Oliver. I'm here to tell you that, because I have migraines almost every day, but uh, they are short, but I, I do have them. But um, there's a book called Migraine, and it's by Oliver Sacks. So look it up and read it. It it will answer your questions. Believe me, it, the man did did a monumental work on on migraine and on epilepsy, as far as that goes, and on hallucinations. So uh, that would be my suggestion because it's a huge subject, huge subject, um, and uh, he studied it in depth and then wrote that wonderful book called migraine so i recommend that 
Yeah, I have it. Uh, my question is different. Maybe I will ask it in next sessions, but thanks anyway. Okay. Caught me just getting the book title to put into the shared section. So I'm just going to get it into there. Meanwhile, thanks for the information, Terry, that you're putting there. Nice to see Tupac Acabra. Haven't seen you for a while. Ah, oh, Bruce Arfenton, how are you doing? And also Third Eye Seeker. We all moved around then, all the icons pretty quick. Right. So, Terry, you were saying? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I, I just had the Wikipedia page with the, app, the actual numbers on the cycles and stuff. The whole cycle of um, different ages is like 4 million, some incredible number starts with a four and it's a million and then there's more numbers. So our history does not cover all that. So I'm just saying it, it could very well have been a golden age. Very well could have been. Um, but our current history doesn't even touch a fraction of that cycle. Oh, definitely, because we don't know what's gone before, because we've lost documentation if things have happened in that manner. It's a very wide area. And again, for people should go around and follow Tupacabra, also Bruce Arfenton as well, as obviously Dee and Myron and Richard's here as well, which is good. And Myron, definitely, and Tamara. Third Eye Seeker, how are you doing? Hey, hey, so I hear the word uh, history, so I'm wondering what specifically about history are you guys talking about, and what is uh, what are we talking about in terms of the timeline? Are we talking about a potential past um, history that it's been lost through, you know, various ways? Well, we're just into the last five minutes of our previous discussion, and where we were leading into that was, obviously, when things go through cataclysm, information is lost and Bruce R. Fenton will say the same thing on this that you don't know what's there until you either find something <laughs> again like you were finding and talking about down in Miami but it was just an overview discussion about it because we were discussing with our guest Rick Herrick his book and also the way that people don't in uh... religions should have Losing their ideology, but basically take the tenant that be nice to people and treat them like yourselves, how you'd like to be treated. And we were just talking about how it happens in different civilizations and different history at that point. We weren't picking a specific time period at this present time. Gotcha. Yeah, um, definitely. The, the, so for some of you who don't know, uh, that's kind of that's what my page is about. It's about ancient history. My niche in this whole thing is the ancient megalithic structures. By proxy, I do speak to a lot of uh, researchers, um, archaeologists, and others in that field, right? And uh, one of the sites that I have been closely more um, working on, obviously, the Miami location. It's actually one of the first ones on site for that one, uh, the, talking about the 7,000-year-old site in, in Miami. But, I've gone to other, I, I've gone virtually around the whole world, um, places like Bimney Road. I've gone down south to the sovereign American countries, uh, you know, heavily focused up in the, in the European regions, specifically in Italy, for example. Um, done a lot of work there, on, especially under, underneath Rome, when you find these ancient cities that have been built on top of. And one of the ones that I'm more fond of that I have to do more work on, much of the schedule. Um, I'm going to be heading over to that side of the world, but the whole Atlantis story is always fascinating, it's fascinating me as a child. And I just want to try to do a little bit more work on that one, especially since it's a more hot topic now. Um, I believe that there's a really high prevalency, and this is to tie into the conversation, that I do feel that there's a, a very large possibility that, that that city of Atlantis, at least the main city, right? It's probably been lost to a cataclysmic, a cataclysmic event, um, which in this case would have been the continental uh, shelves, the actual tectonic plates. Uh, for those of you who don't know, under the Mediterranean Sea, there's actually a lost continent. There was once a continent down in that region, and right? it submerged. So it's very possible and highly probable that if Atlantis was in that region, which is described to be through the... Straits of Gibraltar, right? That's the Iberian region between Spain and Northern Africa. 
if that's the case, then if this was that long ago, we're talking about more than 200,000 years ago, we're going into the millions, right? More than likely, if it was in that region and it was shoved under the tectonic plates, there would be no trace of a city like Atlantis or any for that fact. We would never find it. So we lose it through time, not just because of pillage and war and, and cataclysmic events from external, like a meteorite, right? But we lose it because of natural occurring phenomenon as well. Well said. And you've given me just that minute extra for running away and closing this whole thing down. But I mean, <laughs> succinctly done. I enjoy the way that you do that. I mean, obviously, we're going to get together and have a conversation on a greater topic, which would be superb. And obviously, if Bruce or Tupacabra want to come up and just quickly give less than a 30 second overduction of themselves before we close down, I'm quite happy for that to happen. I've sent out invites. I'll just check to see how many invites have already been sent out on here. And if they want to come up, maybe they can't come up. It's Paul. Yeah. For the last 25 years, um, written on rewriting the out of Africa theory and human origins, like locations, migrations, yeah, you know, Neanderthals, Denison, all of that topic, but also on you know, Gebekli Tepe and you know, ancient Egypt. So the, a wide gamut. You know, most of it rewriting where the rise came i say down in australasia southeast asia and all that area and i think that that was the heart of what we think of as the kind of global atlantean civilization very quick follow-on from what was just said by the way in spain down the south of spain you've got some amazing megalithic sites which i think are the you know the and we know even sort of from whoever lived in atlantis is a really cool site and just this week i don't know if you guys caught that there was the dna study that shows that spain was a refuge the of- cave the cave yeah yeah so i mean you, you would have had well, they found the genome yeah so it's really cool if you think all those people from pre the ice age was it didn't die off they were down sort of in that area so they would have continued on any knowledge from the previous so you start to see how these people link up so that is kind of cool right yeah thanks a lot for letting me have a, a moment oh that's not I a problem posted on the nest about that perception i'm just gonna drag it up and put it in there do Carbra, take the stage while i'm looking for my little piece of information Will do. Will do. Good to see you, Paul. This is uh, always good to see Myron in here. Third Eye, Bruce, uh, you guys are all so great. Um, yeah, great topic, too. What the hell do we know about the past? What we are starting to discover, I think, because we, we, we get so solid in our idea the now and we to move forward, like, oh, that must be that way. Let's move forward with that information. And then we build on top of stuff. And I think Graham Hancock said it best, you know, we're we're building our stuff on like sand, you know, where this is the, all of our stuff is on a foundation of sand. It's going to shift and it's going to rock and it's going to, uh, there'll, there'll be lands, total landslides and collapses of the foundation at times. Um, so these types of conversations where we're kind of exploring those uh, realms, it's going to make that collapse a little bit soft. It's going to soften the blow a little bit. And so, yeah, it's one of the things I like to do is explore things with thought experiments, uh, concepts, think outside the box. Uh, I do pride myself in my knowledge of anecdotal, you know, factoids. And I think we all do. But I, one of my favorite things is uh, the revelations where, oh, shit, I was wrong about that. Or that was completely bad. And so I just always strive to find that information and kind of help revolutionize my... Paul, still... Very quick on that. Still time. The thing. No, 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 you caught me throwing things into the nest. And obviously, a, <laughs> swapping between buttons is always good fun. It's always better to be on mute. So it's just gone up there. You were going to say something, Bruce, before I close the room down? Yeah, very quickly, just to say, similar to what Tupac was saying, I mean, for a long time, I didn't put any great focus, particularly down in Australasia, and now it's the centre of almost all of my hypotheses and research. It's the, it's the way things flip around, you know, Egypt, everything, Samaria. And all. But it's funny how things can come as a curveball, and you realise that you maybe have missed, you know, a huge, um, you know, red flag, something more interesting somewhere else. So, yeah, no, I agree with them. Okay, thanks. Oh, not a problem. So I would say if you want to have a quickly look at the one that we are discussing that Bruce brought up, I put the link up there. It says archaeologists. And there you go from there. But no, thank you very much for everyone putting up with the technical difficulties at the beginning of this event and also coming through with great conversation and talking to Rick. The reason I'm laughing is because Tamara said at the very beginning, before we even started the event, this one won't crash, will it? Because previously, last week, we had five crashes. And now she started throwing up emoticons of smiling faces with 
crying tears of laughter. So it tends to take me on the back foot when I see that. It's always good fun. Oh, hello, Logan. Haven't seen you for a while. And also other people. But thank you very much again for turning up. There's lots more in the pipeline that I'm working on, talking about consciousness and how we're all relating it together and how obviously it fits in with all the topics of history and also civilizations and cultures. And again, personal experience, if you've got these perceptional changes, whether it's medical or just picking up information in different ways, this is what our community likes to discuss and then pass those people to other communities to help them or come back the other direction and uh, help us, which is fantastic because we're all growing with knowledge as we go along because it's all about that thoughtful, contemplative discussion. So thanks again, everybody, for turning up. And Tamara, you still there? Yeah, right here. <laughs> By yeah, the way, we're still third eye, your name's not Tamara unless you've decided to change, have you? Pardon me? <laughs> I was asking Tamara if she was there. I am. Yeah. The mic and wasn't working, though. As far as I know, third eye <laughs> is not Tamara. Are you, Dan? <laughs> <laughs> Pardon, I, I, I'm, I was just so confused. I was like cut off. I, I was having technical difficulties earlier today. Um, not sure what's going on, but uh, I'll try to participate tomorrow. We don't like identity theft in this room, Dan. <laughs> you can't become Tamara. <laughs> I apologize. No, it's okay. It's just funny when people go, yeah, da, 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 da. But you're not the person I was talking to, and I'm sure I used their name clearly. I don't know why I even responded. I, I even thought to myself, wait a second. Uh, I didn't, I don't know. I'm, I'm in a trance. I hope you're not driving as well, because you don't want to be in a trance while you're driving. Uh, well, of course, you know, no, today, not driving. You can be anything you want to be. Oh, definitely. We're all one. Tamara, I'm talking to Tamara now, Dan. Okay. Are you sure? I'm, I, I am now, which is good. <laughs> Just want to check. I wouldn't count on that. <laughs> no. You're being but, overly optimistic. Yes. So, Tamara, luckily enough, it was only the one crash and we survived the rest of it, which is good. One crash? I, I counted three. <laughs> I counted six. Look, you've just burst the bubble for all those people who just don't believe what happens in the editing later on, okay? Oh, no. <laughs> it's all on YouTube. Yeah, I think it was definitely. Bumped off. I think it was bumped off three Three times? Four times? I kind of lost count. For those that are listening on YouTube, that's knocked out of a room. Not she was going around doing assassinations, no. okay? <laughs> I've been kickboxing in between. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be the case of it all. Anyway. Well, I I, like I kicked, I'll tell you. Oh, yeah, it's difficult while talking to people, while trying to pull people back in and trying to give them the invite and their phones crashing and all the bits in between, which is always good for technology. I, I still don't know how I got in. I have no idea. But can you get out? That's the main thing. Uh, You're probably yeah. going to be locked I in this one. I hope I could. There's other things on top of, my, of, of your broadcast that, that shouldn't be there. So I don't yeah. know. I, I could be in somebody else's space. Maybe. I think that's the way it's going to be. So I'm just going to take the one from the third eyed, which is Dan. Dan, this is hey. your name. Yes. <laughs> Hey, so um, I actually uh, see Bruce. Uh, I believe he's a ge uh, is he a geologist of some sort, or I haven't come across him before. But uh, was wondering if you can go ahead. I'm sorry, Bruce. No, I'm not a professional geologist. I mean, I'm an amateur, uh, equally, equally a citizen scientist. So yeah, I take an interest in archaeology, geology, anthropology, and obviously techno signatures and. Or not, but none of it at a professional level. I'm an IT professional in terms of university, so um, yeah, yes. step forward. Okay, yeah, because I, I, I was going to ask you a few, uh, probably send you a DM. I have a couple of pictures and stuff that I wanted to send. Uh, I'm trying to decipher something and I can't tell if it's a natural geo geological formation and one of the sites that I visited. So I, I can tell you that's been a hard lesson for me to realize that, yeah, how many things that um, I would think were made that are actually natural but i mean i do defer to the geologists and they kind of have taught me a bit over the years that yeah it's amazing what nature can do yeah definitely i've, I've been fooled a couple times as well but the, the last one that i'm i've been really going back and forth is this whole the bimini road down here in the, like florida and the bahamas uh, I, I i keep on going back and forth with the geologists and i'm telling them that yes i get the rocks are natural formations but the propping up of these stones, it cannot be a natural formation. There's just no way around that. But 
That's why I was hate to, to butt in on this private conversation that you got going on, but I've been trying to close the room for the last four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave it for next time. <laughs> you could take the conversation elsewhere if you want. <laughs> I'd follow Bruce, by the way. Click on him and make sure that you've got right, connections well, to him, Third Eye. It's adios and muchas gracias. Definitely. And obviously, I will speak to you all again, which would be great. And thank you for all turning up. Thank you. Speak to you all soon. Bye. Bye. <laughs> no laughing.